with that type of worship makes me feel good that no matter how bad my sermon is, it was worth coming to church this morning already. Uh, I don't know about you, but just getting back to some normalcy and being able to spend time to worship like that, wow, um, I know that did my heart so good to do that and be doing that with you. And this morning as we open up God's Word, we are starting a brand new series. We were supposed to start it last week. Obviously, we didn't do the storm, but you know, God's timing is perfect. I don't know why all that stuff happens. If you want to ask me those really hard questions, you need to go to somebody smarter than me like Tommy, and he'll answer it all. But what I do know is that we're going to start it this morning, and we're going to be in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. We're starting a series where we go through this book. Now, I want you to know we're not going to be going verse by verse by verse through Proverbs because we would spend the next two years uh, doing that. But what we are going to do is go through this book, this powerful book of wisdom, and we are going to pull out these pieces, these parts that, man, they are so packed full of stuff that we need to know. It's so important. If it, I know some people read this book in many different ways, and I'm hoping to explain it maybe in a different way than you've heard it before, or maybe just to help us, because sometimes I think this book honestly can be misused in a way. If you, if you know your Bible or if you've read through the Old Testament, you know in 1 Kings chapter 3, this is kind of to, to set up this book, uh, King Solomon, who was David's son, he asked God for wisdom to lead Israel. And it was something, a request that God answered. God gave him this incredible wisdom. And we know he is the wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus. And so Solomon began to write all this wisdom down. And he wrote about everything, thousands of, of scrolls of, about nature, about, about God, about everything you can imagine. He would write all this stuff down, and people would literally went to him to listen, and, and they would read these scrolls, and then that wisdom would then be passed down to other people. And so the book of Proverbs, though it's not 100% written uh, by Solomon, most of it is, and the wisdom is coming from him. The last couple chapters, when we get to there in a few weeks, we're not written by him, and we'll explain that later. But we, we've got this book, and it's just packed full of all this stuff, and it's kind of like, so what do we do with it? What do we do with this book? Because the cool part is, is that it is written to all different ages and stages of life. So really, there's nobody in here uh, or anyone watching online, that if you've read through the book of Proverbs, or you read the Proverbs, where you go, well, none of that spoke to me. He really covers everything and every body and, again, all the different stages of life. So that's why as we, go th we spend the next several weeks going through this, if today isn't it, there will be a day, I promise, there will be a Sunday where you're like, wow, that's something that really spoke to me. That was something I really needed to hear because that's exactly what I'm going through or what we're going through as a family. I needed to hear that wisdom. One of the best ways that I heard it put was, Proverbs is a gift from God for us to learn wisdom from previous generations. And I love that because, you know, I love history, first of all. And if we don't learn from history, it's going to repeat itself, especially the negative things. But the good thing is we can look back to history and learn from the positive things, the wisdom that's there and say, okay, now I want to apply that to my life. I want to begin to live this way, the way God has called me to live. But before we can cover the first seven verses, which by the way, that's, that's all we're going to have time to cover this morning, is the first seven verses of, of Proverbs. Um, and, and the reason for that is just, again, I want to kind of set this book up for us. I want us to be able to understand it thoroughly before we ever dive into it. And the first thing I want to talk about is this word proverb, because I think it, it maybe some people understand it, maybe some people don't. Most people understand the word proverb or a proverb. It, proverb is just a short saying Normally, it offers some kind of wisdom, right? And so most of us get that. Most of us understand that part of it. But where we get ourselves into trouble is when we, and this happens a lot, where we take a proverb, uh, or in this case, the whole book of Proverbs, and we can then end up making the Proverbs into something they were never intended to be or something they had never even claimed to be. And, and people do this a lot. They, they take a proverb, and you maybe have heard people quote things, and, and it's, it's kind of like nails on a chalkboard sometimes to me because they'll, they'll quote it, and we're like, wow, that's not even close to what that means, but okay. And you try to help them maybe see that, but sometimes we, we, we take this stuff and we twist it, or we don't really understand um, what it's all about, or we get frustrated with it because we don't really understand what a proverb is. Is. So I'm going to give us four really quick things that are, these are crucial. We need to remember these four things as we go through these next several weeks, especially. And anytime we read the book of Proverbs, no matter, you know, after this sermon series is over, you're reading through, 
know these things and remember these things. And here they are, real quickly. Number one, Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not promises. That'll get you in a lot of trouble if you don't know that. The second thing is, Proverbs are not guarantees. They're not guarantees. That also could get you in a whole lot of trouble when, when you're looking through the book of Proverbs or what you're expecting. The third thing, Proverbs are wisdom that lead to strong probabilities. This is what I mean by that. If you live the way God tells you to, things will likely go very well for you, right? But it's not a guarantee on this side of heaven that your life will not have trouble as long as you live by these Proverbs. See, some people, they get upset or they get mad at God. They're like, listen, I did this and this and this and this, yet my life, there's so much struggle in it. There's so much pain. There's things that, more than likely, you're going to have a pretty good life and you're going to, things are going to work out better for you had you then chose your own way to do things. But when you put too much on a proverb to the point where you're like making it a promise, making it a guarantee, I did this, so God owes me this. This should have not happened to me. You're taking it out of context of what it was meant for what it, and what it actually means, what it stands for. So we've got to be careful here when, we, when we're looking through these. The fourth one, Proverbs are a guide for how to live well in the world that God created. So I want us to put those things in our mind. Those are going to be super important foundation and background as we spend the next several weeks covering this book and we seek this godly wisdom that it does provide for us. Now I think it's, it's no secret you and I and just everybody in this world, we, de- we have this desire. We desperate, desperately want to win at life. I think most people do. Every once in a while you run into somebody and, and maybe there's some things going on in their life that are, or maybe even in their health that they're not this way. But the majority of people want to win at life. People want to succeed in everyday life. And Christians are no different. So what do we tend to do? We tend to search for all of these different tips and books and and we, we go to our favorite authors, and these, we, we go online, and we, we read all these different experts. We watch their videos. We go to YouTube for everything, right? And which it does have just about everything. But this is where we're tending to go now. We didn't used to have all that. We had books. But, you know, we didn't really have the whole Internet that we've got now. And it seems like right now, we're, when somebody wants an answer for something, they, they're desperate. They, they want to, to know more. They want wisdom. They'll turn to the Internet or to what we call experts or books, or whatever you want to call it, way before they ever turn to the Bible. And so the problem with Christians is, again, we look everywhere but the Bible to learn about how to parent, how to handle finances, how to have a good marriage, how to succeed in the workplace, and you can pretty much name it, all the different areas of life. Many times we go to these things before we ever go to the Bible, and it seems like That even Christians who want a Christian perspective on these topics are more likely to go to a Christian book than they are the book, the Bible. They they want to go to somebody that maybe has read the Bible and maybe is going to include a few things about it in there. But we tend to go there long before we ever go to the Bible itself. And I think that's because we don't really want the Word. We tend to want quick, practical tips and strategies that have been plucked from the world. Now, I think most Christ followers... I really think that they believe the Bible is God's word. I think that most Christ followers believe it is authoritative, that it is perfect. But somehow, many have bought into the misconception that the Bible doesn't do a great job of addressing the nitty-gritty details of life. So we tend to kind of push it to this side. Or what ends up happening, if we're honest, many times we end up doing no more than skimming through here, right? Flipping through things, maybe go to the back, and look at something or go to the look at read some of the notes just trying to see if maybe we can find a little piece of something here or there skimming through the word looking for some helpful tips for the day but here's what's even crazier that problem or the problem doesn't even stop there the problem is even if we do look to the bible and i know many people do even if we do somehow pull out some tips for how we are to live a better life most of the time we don't even follow what we already know. Think of how often we mess up. This is the part of the sermon none of us are going to like. But that's okay. We need to hear this. Think of how often you and I mess up. Think about the hurtful words we've said to a friend or a spouse or to parents. Think of the times that we spoke too quickly and we couldn't get our words back. Think about the mistakes that we've made with our children. Think about the times our children saw us do something that we told them not to do. 
or heard us say something that we told them not to say. Think about the grudge that we've held on to and refused to let go of because someone really has hurt us. Think about how we repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over and don't learn from them. And the truth is, we could go on and on and on, and we would all walk out of here feeling like, thanks, Darren, I feel glad I came to church today. Couldn't you just let Tommy do worship, and you could have shut up, and then it would have felt a whole lot better. But the reason I bring that up, because what does all that tell us? It tells us that we have a major problem. It tells us that many times we are not wise, and it tells us that we are in desperate need of wisdom to make decisions and navigate our way through life. What I'm trying to set up for us this morning is for us to realize we need this. We need the book of Proverbs. We need to pay attention to what it says. We need to use the Bible for, for a resource, not just to kind of skim through and go, okay, I'll take that, but to understand the wisdom that is here and what it's meant to do in our lives, if we will apply it correctly. The Bible says that at creation, there was a perfect harmony between people and God, even between people themselves and between people and the world around them. There was this order to things, but then human sin, the fall, right? It broke all of that because people sought knowledge and wisdom apart from God. They messed everything up, right? We messed everything up. And once a man's vertical relationship with God is out of whack, so were his horizontal relationships with other people and the world around him. And so these Proverbs, they, they are going, what we're going to be covering are all about restoring that harmony through Jesus Christ. Because if our vertical relationship with God is right, through Jesus, we can be right with others and the world around us. And so this is why we're doing this. This is why we're going through this. We've got to have that right. We've got to be right with God. We've got to be doing things correctly if we then want our relationships horizontally to work as well in our life, if we want wisdom to be a part of who we are. So we're going to read these first seven verses of Proverbs, and then I'm going to dig into this book of wisdom uh, alongside you, and hopefully we're going to walk out of here this morning uh, wiser, uh, not because of something I've said, but because of something that has come from God's Word. So let's read these first seven verses of Proverbs chapter 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So immediately, we see Proverbs connects wisdom with the kingship and the Messiah. Son of David is a messianic title. So we see that right off the bat. And then in verse 2, it clearly states the purpose of the book, which is to impart wisdom to the reader. So the goal when we read Proverbs is for us to end up being wiser. We read this, we, we hear it, we believe it, we begin to apply it to our lives, we become wiser. We do things differently than probably we would do, I know what we would do in our flesh, in the way we would typically react to things, or things we would think that were good aren't really good. Because we read through here and we're like, oh, okay, if that's what God's word says, that's not exactly how I would have handled it or what I would have done, but I trust this and I trust the wisdom from it and I'm going to apply that to my life. And Solomon uses several words here. Uh, that kind of help us grasp wisdom and what wisdom entails. And we're going to go through these. There's four of them uh, that tell us kind of what wisdom is. The first one is this. Wisdom is correction and understanding. Wisdom is correction and understanding. Wisdom is the kind of knowledge that helps you know what is going on around you. And by the way, this is super important. The, this requires humility for all of us to recognize that we don't know everything and we need to receive counsel from others. Now I've heard, and, and I'm not just going to pick on the guys here, but I, guys, I know a lot of you that through the 22 years that I've been here and I've tried to help in different situations in your lives, whether it's 
your marriages or just your jobs or just you as individuals. So many times when it comes to someone suggesting that you need to talk to someone, you need to seek wise counsel or go to a counselor, a Christian counselor, whatever it is, so many times guys will be like, no, nah, I don't need that. I can figure it out myself. I just want you to know if that's your first thought, you are not being wise. The wisest man that's ever lived is telling you, not just me, the wisest man that's ever lived is telling you that is not wise. It is not wise. How we respond to correction, to teaching, to counsel is proof of whether we are wise or not. The know-it-all is not as wise as they think. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls them a fool. The word correction or discipline, it entails this discipleship type of relationship where you can be warned about going in the wrong direction. We need this. We all need this. This is so important. So we're going to stop right here. I want you to answer this question in your heart and in your mind. Okay? And I, I, I'll answer it in my heart and my mind as well with you. I promise I've done that many times as I've gone through this, this sermon. And that's this. Do you have a relationship in your life right now where someone can correct you? Do you have a relationship right now where someone can correct you? And I'm going to take this a little step further and say outside of your spouse. It's, if you do have a wife or a husband that will do this for you and does this for you and is, is there for you and loves you enough to tell you the truth, you're way ahead of most people and you should be thankful to God that you have that. But I think it's even important to have somebody outside of that. Someone on the outside looking in that knows you well enough that you have literally given the freedom to say to you, listen, I'm noticing something in your life that I just don't, I don't think it's a good thing. Someone who has the freedom to, to call you out. Someone who can say to you, what the heck are you doing? And you're not going to get mad at them and, and shun them and say, you know what? I can't say that from the stage. Wait a minute. I, my mind is going through his words. I'm trying. I'm getting better at this. But you, can say to some, they, they won't, you won't say to them, leave me alone. Forget about it. I don't care what you think. I'm going on. You don't know what you're talking about. It, no, there's someone that you have given permission to speak in your life and say, listen, I don't think what you said in this moment was the right thing. Or I think you hurt so-and-so's feelings, and I think you need to probably go to them and, and get that corrected. Or I'm noticing a pattern in your life and something else I've seen, and you're not the same person that you were. And I just feel like the fact that you've introduced this into your life is just not the best thing. And, and someone that can do that, do you have someone in your life that you've given permission to do that? If you don't, you need to find that person. And you need to give them permission and say to them, it's okay. I want you to watch me and, and, and just, if you ever see an error in my life, an error in my way, you see something I'm not doing right, I need that. I have that in my life. I have to. Outside of even Jen, it, that people can, can say to me, Darren, I don't think what you're doing is right. We need to have that. That is wisdom. We all need brothers and sisters in Christ who can correct us. Solomon is saying, if you do, that's wisdom. Second thing, wisdom is the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 3 says there, for receiving instruction is prudent, in, in prudent, prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. So Solomon says wisdom is ethical. He says that the purpose of the book for us as the readers to receive instruction in order to do what is right and just and fair. Therefore, biblical wisdom is not intelligence or a high IQ. It's the knowledge of good and evil. A wise person can tell the difference between right and wrong in the situations in which they find themselves. But it has nothing to do with someone that's got this massive IQ. Foolishness lacks the ability to discern good and evil. And there's so many people that you're like, oh, man, they're so smart and they've got... They've got more degrees than a thermometer. This person's got to know it all. They've got it all together. And they can totally not be wise. They can be smart. And many of us know those really, really smart people that have no common sense, right? We all know that. we got those friends in our life, and we're like, dang, you know, it's a good thing if they are. It's, it's a good thing you're good looking or you're beautiful because Lord knows you are not very wise. You, you, so we have those people in our life that just because they have one thing doesn't mean that they're wise. Even if they're super intelligent, it doesn't mean that they're wise, that they understand and discern good and evil. Adam and Eve were prohibited access to the tree of knowledge and good and evil in the Garden of Eden, not because God was giving them some random 
rule to break so that one day that he could send his son to die for sinners and save us from hell. No, he wanted to teach humanity to depend on him for that knowledge instead of determining it for themselves. God determines what is good and what is evil. That's not for you and I to decide. God determines what is good and what is evil. However, humans decided to trust their voice or trust the voice of the serpent and what was in their own eyes what they thought was best. Adam and Eve sought wisdom apart from God and his word. And that's foolishness. It seemed right to them, but it was foolish. And foolishness, according to Genesis and Proverbs, always ends in death. Now, I don't want to skip ahead, but Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, we'll get there eventually. But it does tell us that knowledge and understanding come from the mouth of God. And this is why we are to submit to the word of God and not to what we think is right. The chaos and the confusion in our society right now is due to humankind doing what is right in our own eyes rather than what God has revealed in his word. This is the problem we're having. There's so many out there right now that are, they think they know what is right. They're doing what they think is right. What as a human they think is right, but they forget that they are flawed. They don't know what is right. Only God determines what is good and what is evil. But here's the thing. It's not just true for those who approve of abortion and those who have redefined marriage. Many of us in the church have also failed to submit to God's way. We agree that wisdom is to be found in God's word. And we agree that we should submit to what it says in all things. Most every Christian is going to say that, that they believe that, and that that's, that's what they stand by. Except for our own situations, which for some reason we think are the exceptions. This is that moment, guys, that the truth is we just got to put our steel-toed boots on and, and just recognize and call it what it is. We are so quick to jump all over those who are publicly for abortion and same-sex marriage, and we should be against those things and stand against those things because they do go against God's word. But yet we are over here on the other side saying and believing things like, I know God's word says that we shouldn't have sex before marriage or live together, but I also know that God doesn't want me to be miserable and he understands my situation. I know God's word says that I should forgive, but God understands what was done to me, and so God understands it and understands why I won't forgive and he's okay with it. I know God's word says that I should be reading it and growing in it, but I also know that God realizes just how busy I am. And we just continue, and I could go down here and make us all feel extremely terrible, even worse than we maybe already do. We, it's, when it comes to us, and it gets kind of personal, and it's not those hot topics that are in the news all the time, but it's personal stuff with ourselves, we tend to rationalize it all, and, and we're fine with being on the other side of that. God understands. God understands. Yet his word says something completely different than the way we're living. We find all kinds of ways to evade God's word for what seems to be what is better in our own eyes. And no matter what the reason is for it, Solomon says, and ultimately God says, it's foolishness. Instead, we need to submit to the wisdom, the knowledge of good and evil in all things that God gives us clearly in his word. We can't pick and choose what we're going to stand against and fight for and then stand over here and not fight against and fight for these other things just because they're harder to deal with and they're not as black and white as we may would say in the, in, in the mainstream media. We've got to be careful with this. We can become very pharisaical in these moments. Third thing, wisdom is. Wisdom is discernment. Proverbs 1 4 says, for giving, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Wisdom is the ability to read a situation and make the right decision. Solomon is wanting here to give this discernment to the inexperienced, to the youth. Inexperienced people are not wise or foolish yet 
See, this is what he's, he's getting at here. Inexperience and youthfulness, often those things go hand in hand. And what, that is what Solomon is so concerned about. And Moses, by the way, is super concerned about in Deuteronomy chapter 6, making sure that parents are teaching their children right and wrong. Because Proverbs tells us that those of us who are parents and grandparents, that is our task to instruct our children in wisdom. Those who are young, those who are inexperienced, need to be taught to perceive what is going on, make the right decisions, and avoid the bad ones. That is, that's our responsibility to teach these things, both to those who are young in age, but also those who are inexperienced, those who maybe don't know God's Word, those who didn't grow up in the church. Yes, we need to stand against schools teaching against God's Word. That is something we need to stand against. But we also need to be teaching our kids at home so they already know before they ever get to the school. See, this is the big problem with a lot of parents is I, I'm 100% with you. I'm appalled at the things that, that in, I know we live kind of more in a secluded, more safe area here in Hardy County. But it's coming our way, and it's already here in some level. But in other places, it's, it's just blatant. I mean, they're, they're bringing in all kinds of things to the schools and teaching these children about things that they don't, first of all, shouldn't be taught at that age. But second, it's against God's word. It's, they don't even know what good and evil is, yet they're putting it on these, these, these young children. They're teaching them at a young age when they're still developing their hearts and their minds, which Satan knows is the way to attack them. And so they're doing this. So yes, we should stand against that and fight against that. But we also should not be relying on the, even the school or even the youth ministries and children's ministries of our church to be the only thing that's teaching them right and wrong, and good and evil. They should be learning that at home. Everything else should be supplementing that. When your kids get to school and they see it, they should immediately know that's, that's evil. Because my mom and dad have taught me what this says. But mom and dad, you can't teach them what this says when you don't know what this says. We've got to be reading this. We've got to understand this. We've got to take it to heart. And we've got to be passing it on and teaching wisdom. And we've got to be teaching discernment. They should be able to discern what is good and evil. They should be able to discern right from wrong. What God says is okay and what God says is not okay. Wisdom is having discernment. The fourth thing is this. Wisdom is obtaining guidance. Verses 5 and 6, it says, Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Solomon says that a wise man will listen and add to their learning. A wise man will acquire direction and guidance. And I think this is very interesting because the audience that Solomon refers to here in this verse is a wise person. What does, that, what does that tell us? He says that the wise need to grow in learning and get direction. The truly wise will have the, enough humility to know that they still need to listen to counsel instead of having the arrogance to think that they have arrived. I read this as I was preparing for the sermon. I really liked what it said. It says, wisdom is not a goal to attain. It's a pursuit that you spend your whole life on. We should be adding things into our lives on a continual basis that will help us learn and discern and understand God's word better. You know, this is part of the, the reasoning for these growth tracks that we're starting, uh, starting next Sunday, Sunday evening, because we need to learn. We need the word of God in our hearts and our minds. And some of you, I don't know, I'm just, I have, no one said this to me. But there, I would guess in a group this large or, and those watching online, there might be a a few of you that are like, you know what, I don't really know the good. I kind of know the word. I, I've been in church my whole life. I don't think I really need These are some of the basic classes. I'll wait till they get to the harder stuff. I'm telling you, it, it, it would do all of us good to, to learn from these things. And yes, they're limited and we only take so many people. But if that's you, if you're wondering, maybe should I? I don't, it, it, trust me, it's not going to hurt you. I know that you're a Bible scholar, but it's not going to hurt you if you want to come and learn and start from that foundational basis that says, I need to learn more. I can always learn more. I need to make sure I know God's word. But now that Solomon has described what wisdom is, I want us to look at how we can get it and what is the key to being wise like this. And I love what Solomon says and how he puts it. He says, you get wisdom by reverent trust in the Lord. You get wisdom by reverent trust in the Lord. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of, the reverence for the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
So Proverbs is super, super clear that the way to get wisdom is to depend on God rather than on yourself. We, we have to do that. Now, it sounds good to say that, but to do that is a whole other set of circumstances. That means there's going to be moments you've got to make a decision or you've got to do something, you physically do something, say something that you don't really want to say or do or, or go be a part of or whatever because you know God told you to do it. Whether you want to do it or not, he outranks you. This is getting to that point in your life. The everyday details of our life are lived in fear of the Lord. We fear God so much in a reverent way that we, of course, are going to do what he says and we're going to not do the things that he says for us not to do. Even if it's inconvenient, even if it's difficult, even if everyone's going to laugh at us, even if everyone's going to judge us, it does not matter because we fear God more than we fear man. This is what Proverbs is trying to explain. This is what Solomon is trying to listen. He's saying, this is wisdom God has given to me, and I'm just passing it on to you. There isn't supposed to be a sacred and secular divide in our lives. We so often think that going to church and in different kind of mission efforts and our quiet times, those are the, the godly things in our life, the godly parts of our lives. Other things like work and our kids' sports teams and how we spend our money, those are secular, neutral parts of our lives. But Solomon completely crushes that. The everyday decisions that we make are to be done in fear of the Lord, and the everyday decisions we make reveal whether we fear the Lord. Let me say that again. The everyday decisions that we make are to be done in fear of the Lord, and the everyday decisions we make reveal whether we fear the Lord. God is concerned with our whole life, church. Not just parts of it, every bit of it. The everyday decisions we make are indicators of whether we fear Him or not. Every nook and cranny of our life is to be governed by God. When I meet with people, and some of them are my friends, and, and you know, I'll say it this way. Some of them, I think, have given me permission to speak into their life. Other times, I just speak it, and I don't know that I necessarily have permission. But, but I'll say something to them, and I guess what is kind of like the, the nails on the chalkboard to me are when you hear things like, I know what you're saying, preacher. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. And I, you're right. Just hope God has grace for me. Just hope God's going to forgive me. Or I just hope God... And there's this... Hope, but it's not a hope that is true hope. Because the Bible doesn't say just hope for it. The Bible says to follow God, to fear Him enough. They don't fear God enough that it had, translates into the things they do and don't do in their life. They're still letting their desires, their arrogance, their, their, what they think is wise, what they want to do, what makes them feel good, what makes it easier in their life, what makes this life better for them is more important than what God's word says, which means they don't fear God like they should. They don't have a healthy view of God. And as long as they don't have that healthy view of God or they don't have that fear of God and they're going to go around with this childish viewpoint of, I hope God is okay with it, I hope God doesn't do it, that's so that's just so arrogant and so childish and so ignorant all at the same time. I can't even express it. Not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to say, these are adults. We, we have to understand. God has laid it out. There's no way you're going to get to heaven and go, well, I just hope you overlook all that. And he's like, well, nope. I would have hoped that you'd have read the word like I told you to or listened to those people that were speaking into your life over and over again that I sent for you, but you chose to do things your way. And I don't want to be there and in that position before God. I fear him too much. There isn't supposed to be this sacred and secular divide in our life. God is concerned with everything. The everyday decisions we make are indicators of whether we fear him or not. And once we start living according to that pattern, we will then walk in wisdom. The only way to be wise is to trust in the Lord and be in a relationship with him. If you read through the Old Testament, you're going to see that though Solomon had all this wisdom, he failed to live out the wisdom of Proverbs. And so did his son, uh, King Rehoboam. But Isaiah chapter 11 promises us that the Messiah will be the embodiment of the book of Proverbs. And when Jesus burst onto the scene, we know that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. And he was called greater than Solomon. 
And what's so awesome about Jesus is that he is wisdom. Wisdom is a person that you can know and have a relationship with. Wisdom is a person that you can love and learn from. Proverbs will teach us that wisdom isn't a bunch of tips that you try and live out. Wisdom is a person. And through a relationship with him, you can be reconciled to God, to others, and the world around you. Through a relationship with Jesus, he will begin to produce in you the wisdom that he desires for you to live out. And without a relationship with Jesus, without the Holy Spirit inside of you, you cannot live this way. You cannot possess godly wisdom. And here's the deal. Even if you claim Jesus as your Savior and you claim that the Holy Spirit is inside you, if you don't fear the Lord to the point that it's more than words or it shows in your actions the things that you do and don't do, until it does that, you will lack wisdom and foolishness will always be a part of your life. This is coming from the wisest man that ever lived, that God showered wisdom upon and he began to write and say listen to these things let me put these things out there for you and thank god that it has been preserved throughout all of of the rest of his life and then on all the way to this 2022 for us to read that's awesome that's a blessing that we can read it it's a whole other thing for us to actually follow it to make it part of our lives to put it inside of us to take these things and we're just getting started in this book this is not a series to come to if you are, you know, you don't like to be, have your, your spiritual feelings hurt because we're all going to get hurt during this. But I hope that we're going to come out of this stronger, wiser, more like Jesus. And the only way we can do that is to implement these things, to be humble enough to admit, I struggle with this, 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 and this, and I'm going to fix these things by starting to do them the way that God's called me to do them. And I'm going to get people in my life that I'm going to allow to speak into my life and help me through this. And I'm going to start listening and become wiser because I have a fear of God that is healthy. And I want to be a wise person. This is where it starts. And so I'm going to have a prayer and we're going to have an invitation after that. And if you don't know Jesus, this is where it starts. You want to make the wisest choice you've ever made in your life? Give your life to Jesus Christ. Place your hope, trust, faith solely in him. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that here in just a second. Let's pray first, though.